to Denver Startup Week. Uh, welcome to our session on IP. Um, if you are networking, it's a beautiful day outside, so go get some fresh air. We love to have you, but now we have our next speakers up. Thank you. So I'm going to whistle. All right, so for our next session, um, we're very glad you're here. I hope you do learn something from these incredible speakers, but also just say hello to the person next to you. We found a lot of Denver Startup Week is just about networking, um, getting to know others in this community. This truly is a give back um, community, part of Denver, Colorado. So um, yeah, meet other people here. Um, and stay long and enjoy. So I have the pleasure of welcoming you to our intellectual property session. We have Zach, Randy, Lou, and Manny. So give it up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Okay. Okay. Can y'all hear me? All right, well, thank you for coming out today. Welcome to our IP section on, on uh, IP strategies for startups. My name is Randy McCarthy, and I am the uh, uh, head of the IP section at Hall Estel. And we have several other panelists here that we're going to want to talk to you about and, and introduce to you as we talk about strategies. Uh, it seems like we ought to kind of talk real quickly about what we are and not going to cover, just so we're all on the same page. This is not going to be a, a technical how-to discussion. We're not going to really be talking about so much about how do you file a patent application or, or you know, those kinds of things. But this is a, this is a strategic how-to kind of discussion where we're going to kind of say, these are the ways that you put together <coughs> excuse me, a strategy for your startup. And, and you look at the various factors that we have. Now, when we talk about intellectual property, everybody knows, knows what it is, but I just kind of want to go over that quickly. We're talking very broadly, patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, the classical types of uh, IP that is used by a, by a startup. But there's also a lot of new categories or, or ancillary categories that probably will have some impact. Obviously, AI-generated content is, is all the rage, and you may be using that. We can talk about that. You want to talk about know-how and, and NDAs and, and uh, uh, rights of publicity and and uh, you want to make sure that you've got you know, copyright issues when you have your websites. There's all sorts of things that we're going to be talking about in this space. So uh, with that having been said, at the end, we're going to have a, a, a question and answer session. If you guys would like to ask some questions, we'll, we'll give you time for that. And then we'll have some, some final takeaways and uh, to, to give you some final tips that you can walk off with. So let me introduce our panel. I'm going to start with Lou uh, Faust here. He's a senior executive, an investor, and an advisor with decades of experience in a number of successful high-tech startups and ventures. Decades and decades. Okay. okay. He was a former Wall Street uh, what, investment banker, but then you saw the light and came over to the good side. But we're glad to have you here. He works heavily in a lot of very high-tech areas, a lot of agricultural and high-tech space. Um, He's uh, working in the renewable energy sector, a lot of interesting things there, and he's helping me with some AI uh, ventures that we're working on. Uh, to my left is Manny Mendez. You all are going to really enjoy hearing from him. He is currently the CFO of Modern.Tech, which is a multi-million dollar software startup, and he's already previously gone through uh, previous uh, several startups to product commercialization, acquisition, and exit. So he's actually done this uh, several times. And he's in the midst of another one. And then to my right is Zach Altaba, who is a registered patent attorney with Hall Estel. He works with me. And he handles all areas of intellectual property law, including patents, trademarks, copyrights, everything. He works with a lot of startups. So if I have you know, something hard, then I give it to Zach. So, so he's my right-hand man. So that's enough about us. Before we get started, let's hear about you all. How many here are investors? Raise your hand. OK. How many of you all are founders? You have a startup going on, right? Excellent. How many of you are like CEOs, say, of your startup? Okay. CFOs, financial guys? Okay. All right. Got, gives us, be proud. You've got a lot of hats to, to, to wear. IP is, is, is both exciting and kind of routine. Just remember it's an asset and it's a tool. And what we want to do today is tell you some of the experiences that these, these uh, uh, gentlemen have gone through kind of give you some do's and don'ts and try to maybe flag some areas for you to pay attention to. So with all of that, let's get started. So we're going to start with Lou. 
Seniority always counts. Okay. Decades of experience. <laughs> decades and decades. All right, Lou. All right, as, as, a, as an investor and as a manager, he'll sometimes come in and be the CEO and, and other things, so you understand his role. When evaluating a company for investment or for joining the management team, uh, what factors are you looking for in general, and then how does their IP position come into the calculus? Um, just a little bit of context. I've Since I left Wall Street, um, I have run four institutionally funded companies here in Colorado, both venture-backed as well as private equity-backed. So when I, and I'm typically brought in by investors at companies at various stages that need some help. So in evaluating that type of situation, whether it's on an employee basis, going in as a CEO, um, or whether it's just strictly when I'm looking to invest my own private capital, you know, I have a formula, as most people do. Um, I first and foremost start with the size of the market. Uh, I personally prefer very large global markets. I have a lot of global experience. My last job on Wall Street was running global operations for a bulge bracket firm. And so, um, so all of the companies that I personally get involved with have typically a large sort of global market and a large global thesis in terms of what they're trying to do. So first and foremost, I look for big, large global markets with certain growth characteristics. Uh, secondly, it's always about kind of the people involved. Um, I have a list of criteria in terms of kind of assessing the management team. So I'll, I'll do an evaluation on the people side. Uh, as Randy said, I look at IP as a strategic asset. Uh, you know, the strength of that, uh, the IP and the importance to the company obviously depends upon the company itself. Um, and then obviously I'm looking for product market fit, traction, all the kinds of typical things uh, that an investor would look at. But also if I'm going in as an employee, I look at pretty much the same thing, uh, the same characteristics kind of on either side. And uh, I'm also kind of a numbers and a data person. So I'm always looking at the numbers. I'm always looking at gross margin. I'm looking at burn. But those are some of the kinds of things I look at when I'm evaluating a new company. What kind of information do you want on their IP portfolio? I mean, do you need a detailed dive or just a high level? <laughs> well, I always start with just, you know, give me your kind of high level view in terms of how you look at IP and how strategic it is to your company. So, and it just depends upon the company. Some companies don't have, you know, a lot of intellectual property. Um, other companies have a significant amount. And Randy and I have worked together on a number of companies through the years. Um, in, you know, we've had everything with a founder who is so um, careful about their IP that they won't even allow any of their IP to be evaluated unless someone actually comes into the office. That would be one extreme. Um, and then other companies that are a lot more kind of open about their willingness to talk about it. Um, so it really just kind of depends upon the company and the value of the IP to that particular overall strategy. Again. You know, IP is a strategic asset, so you have to have a strategy. It's a derivative strategy of your overall company strategy, and that's how I look at it. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Let's let's turn to Manny then. All right, you ready? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> as as we said, I'm going to ask a question, but you can basically answer whatever question you want to answer. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. All right. In each of your startups, Manny, what were the types of uh, IP that you got, uh, that you pursued, you know, patents, trademarks, and so on? And, and how did you go about, since you were on the inside, you know, going, going up, how did you identify what you should go protect? Absolutely. So I've worked in hardware, patents, and software, and also trademarks. And so for this particular conversation, I want to focus more on trademarks, because I feel like for startups, that's the one thing you always have to do, because we all got to get a name. So... I'm curious, and so that's something that I am, I'm a very, very curious person. How many of you talked to an attorney before you picked your name of your startup? Interesting, how about your domain? Interesting. So, just imagine that two years after you've launched your startup, you have to change your name because you didn't do your due diligence. Imagine those conversations you're gonna have with your investor if you did not talk to an attorney. So here's an example of what I'm going through literally as of last week. My company, Modern.Tech, started receiving quite a bit of inquiries from people who just didn't know, telling us how bad of a service we were doing or bad technology. And, but we didn't know him. So I told my, 
my support team, hey, why don't you go out and find out what's going on? Go call these people. Well, what ends up happening is that we had a company who just changed the domain to match ours. Interesting. So my CEO is like, scorched earth. <laughs> Come on. Season and desist letters. I'm like, well, it's cooler, Jets. Come on. I'm going to make a call because I've learned to make a call. So I called Zach. Zach is someone that I trust. I've known him for 15 years. And so first thing we started is like, well, let's look at your trademark. Perfect. You've had it a year ago. I'm like, yeah, I made sure of that. That would have been really bad. Uh, well, what happened is that there is this thing called the opposition period, which I was not aware. And what that really means is that I still need to wait. Even though my trademark is pending, it's, it's live now, if someone can com complains, I could lose that patent. Or that trademark, sorry. Yeah. Whoa, that's good that I ask because that's the last thing I want to do is to start a fight before I have a trademark. And that's the value that I think is why we're all here is those questions. It's not the questions that you don't know. It's the questions that you don't even know to ask, which is why it's so important as a startup to have good people around you. Anyway, the opposition period is done today. So yeah, we're going to go in a fight. <laughs> Did you, um, you said you're a software company right now. And have you looked at patenting some of the software? Have you looked into that or have you done that in the past? Have you pursued the patents in the computer related type inventions? I have. Uh, what, what do you think about them? They're okay. I mean, the hardware, it's easier to protect, in my opinion, because software, well, it's in the black box. Good luck finding what's going on in the back in the code. Um, but I really more, as entrepreneurs, I like to focus more on the strategy and the market need, because we're doing so many things. The last thing you want to do is get in a fight with a Fortune 500 company with a mass bigger, bigger budget. I mean, just think about how to run away, make your investors run away from you. It's like, I just got in a fight. <laughs> yeah. No, that's true. Yeah. That's absolutely right. I suppose, though, on the other hand, it gives you a seat at the table with the bigger companies to have some assets locked down, if, if it makes sense to patent them, uh, you know, to have that as part of your portfolio. Absolutely. Absolutely. It also gives you a way to look up ahead of possible landmines. And that's one thing you're going to... That's true. That's one thing you're going to learn about what I do a lot is I have that wrist hat, right? I picture it as like red hat with like fireman, but not really. But basically that's what I do. I have my wrist hat on to make sure that uh, my startups don't fall into traps because it's so easy to do. It's so easy to fail. That's why you have to just have your wrist, wrist hat on. Okay. So like, that's yep. like some landscaping. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Right. That's good. Okay. Thank you. All right, Zach, you're up next. Um, why don't you tell us, you, you, you see a lot of uh, new clients, people come in, prospective clients, you're obviously happy to talk to anybody. Uh, some of them you wind up thinking that they have something in you move forward. So think of that class of people. What does everybody walk in telling you? What, what do they not understand or, or what do they have right? What are the things that you wind up telling every single person that you, that you talk to? You got a shot here to tell everybody at once. Yeah, definitely. So uh, can you hear me? No, uh, no, 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 no. We gave you the, the I got the dud. Here. All right, can you hear me now? All right, perfect. Um, so the first thing that I like to tell anybody that comes to me with uh, an idea of patenting is, do you have, have you, are you solving a problem? Is there a problem out there that you've identified? Is there a need for this product or service that you're offering? And if they tell me yes, great, awesome, you know, it's fantastic. If they tell me no, then usually I try to help them solve or find that problem, identify it because. It's great to get a patent. You know, I think it's fantastic. The purpose of a patent is to prevent other people from making, using, or selling your inventions or ideas in the US. And so I try to tell them that. But at the same time, I tell them, if you haven't identified the problem, and all you're getting is a little certificate on the wall, congratulations for wasting thousands of dollars. Um, and so I think that's something that I always end up saying to people that are trying to at least look for you know, a patent. When it comes to trademarks, it's kind of like what Manny said is, have you done any due diligence? You know, if you're coming uh, to me to try to seek intellectual property protection, what have you done? Who are you servicing? What is the product? Do you have a product? Do you have a service? So it's just trying to identify and see and help the people that are coming to me understand that w what you're getting is an asset. It's ultimately an asset. But is it an asset that someone's going to want? Because if it's not something that someone's going to want in terms of like a product, for instance, then maybe it doesn't make sense to pursue a patent. 
Maybe it makes more sense to keep it tight knit, get NDAs, protect your product, protect your unique idea so that nobody else is gonna get it. But if it's something that people are chomping at the bit for, well, we gotta go protect it, obviously. And how do we protect it? Well, uh, how far are you along? Or uh, is it complete? Are you there already with the idea? Are you ready to move forward with the exact application? Or do you still need some time? Are we trying to prevent somebody else, competitors, from taking your idea from you? If that's the case, then maybe it makes sense to pursue a provisional patent to get that filing date. Because in the US, for patents, the filing date matters. That's what's one of the most important things for patents. And so it, a lot of the starting conversation is exploratory. It's me understanding the technology, understanding their goals. And then when we move along to the end of the conversation, it's about costs. Because everybody wants to know costs. You know, here at Hall Estel, we like to do flat fees. Flat fees are easy to work with, they're understandable. You're not gonna get hit with a random giant budget of some kind, or a bill from us or anything like that. It's gonna be, this is what you're gonna pay, and you're gonna get quality service, and it's gonna cost this. You wanna get this as well, so we're gonna go for a design patent, because you can protect the way something looks. You can go for a utility patent, protect the way something functions. You know, we can go for different trademarks, service marks. And so that's generally how the conversation goes in the beginning. Um, with every startup and every individual inventor as well. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, Lou. What What are your favorite topics, or at least one of mine? Let's talk about pitch decks. Just a little bit. Uh, just a little bit. Okay. Because you know you're obviously evaluating pitch decks whenever you're at. You know you're on the side of going in. But if you do go in, now you're out there trying to raise capital or do other things. So tell us a little bit about pitch decks. What do they do? What's the purpose? Is it a good idea to try to work your IP into it? Give us some, give us some insight there. Uh, that's a separate session in and of itself. But um, in terms of kind of pitch decks, I'll just give you my most recent example. I'm working with an Israeli ag tech company right now. Um, they've successfully raised $15 million in Israel. Um, they have struggled to raise money in the United States. Um, so a friend of mine called me about it because I've been working in the ag tech space now for five or six years. And I uh, said, sure, be happy to take a look at it, send me the pitch deck. Um, and the senior management team at this company are all deeply technical people, right? So the pitch deck read, let me tell you how wonderful my technology is, right? Classic sort of mistake, as opposed to let me tell you the problem that you have that my technology will help solve, right? So I'm pretty nuts about pitch decks, anybody who's ever worked with me on these. Um, I will recommend, actually, that was one of the questions I know Randy has. There's a, a really, really good book called Get Backed. Uh, it's Craft Your Story, Build the Perfect Pitch Deck, and Launch the Venture of Your Dreams. It's by Evan Baer, B-A-E-H-R, and Evan Loomis. Uh, it's probably the best book, and I'm a very big reader. I have a library of books on this subject. Um, it's probably the best I've seen in terms of doing a pitch deck. One of the really valuable parts of this book is it'll give you examples of pitch decks, how many times that company made pitches, and how much money they raised, and how many pitches it took to raise money. That's very difficult data to get your hands on. So, um, so I would recommend that. Um, there's also uh, several books, two books written by uh, Carmen Simon, who's a PhD, I think she's a cognitive psych person, and it's all about creating content that will stay in a person's mind until the point they're called to make a decision, right? That's a really, really important thing, is that you want your information to be in the person's mind at the point that he or she is called to make a decision. So, um, so she has two books out. Um, I'd highly recommend those as well. But in terms of a pitch deck, I like to keep things relatively short. Uh, but, you know, if somebody sends me a big pitch deck, I just don't even look at it. I'll tell them to kind of just go back and, and really try and synthesize the story. And really, it's got to be what problem are you solving and what value are you creating for your identified customer, right? Um, again, I, I think this is a whole separate session, but those would be the things I'd That's say. Fair enough. Good. Yeah. And it's okay to mention the IP, but only in the context of the greater story. 
Right, so where IP is critical, so on this Israeli uh, ag tech company, which is a precision pollination platform, pollination's a, a very large global problem right now because of climate change, declining bee populations, uh, but we have a section in that deck about IP. And again, all it says is, you know, we have these kinds of patents, these kinds of trade secrets, uh, because, you know, if an investor potentially is interested, obviously we'll get into deeper due diligence in terms of the content of the patent and their trade secrets. So, so I always say where IP is central to the value prop, it's always going to be in the deck. Yeah, so, one thing you yeah. told me once was that, the, and I didn't know this, is that, and it, this, is not, this is not absolutely true, but this is a generally true statement, that the purpose for your pitch deck is to get a meeting, right? You're just trying to get interest. You, you don't especially those of us who are technical, I'm an electrical engineer, they asked me to go do something else, so I went back to law school. But uh, as an engineer, you know, we use, uh, we have, it's common to use Power, PowerPoint as a great mechanism to, to put technical stuff in. I, I've read tons of them, and I find, as a technical person, I love reading a, a uh, you know, like a, like a PowerPoint that's just full of graphs and all that. That's fine. You really have to change your thinking, though, because you're not talking to people who are like that, when you're trying to convince them to, to give you a call or let you have a meeting with them to, to start diving into it, you've got to get their interest. You said that these, this one client, and you know, God bless them, right? But they, they, they had this, they told a wonderful story. They had a wonderful story that they told horribly, right? I think that's what, yeah, that's what they said. So don't do that. Okay, I wanted to, I wanted to mention that. I would just say that I think in my decades of experience, <laughs> I think I've had one situation where I had one call and the investor wrote me the check 24 hours later. So, and that's, you know, so typically it's gonna be a process. There are gonna be multiple discussions. So again, the pitch deck is really hopefully to engage someone at a level that he or she is gonna to want to ask a series of deeper conversations, so. There you go, so you don't have to tell everybody everything. Just resist the urge to tell it all at once. And that's hard, because we're all excited about our, our, our tech, we're excited about our startup, that's great. You've got to bring them along slowly. Okay, get the interest. Is, would you agree with that? Is that kind of have you have you done pitch decks and or have you read them? Tell us, tell us that. I think that that's important. I know I'm yeah. I'm fixating on pitch decks here, but this is important. This is an important integral part of how where our we we spend all our time here and now we're going out and engaging the world. So. Yes, I. I've done, seen many pitch decks, and the one, the one of the worst ones I saw was, uh, so one of my, one of my uh, classmates uh, came back to, called me, because he had a deal with a, with a friend of his who was trying to buy a second tier, a second, I don't know if that's correct, but second tier uh, soccer team uh, from, uh, from the Premier League. And so he sends me this pitch deck, and I'm not, it, it looked like a dictionary. It was insane. It was like 25 pages. I didn't even know what was going on. Honestly, I was like, what am I buying here? And so I ripped it apart, not because I was trying to impress him, but because I, was, I felt that he, he needed to, to give that feedback to that, to that uh, potential um, investor, whoever wants to buy that leak. You have to tell a story, and you have to do it in less than 10 to 7 slides, and that's something that I push everyone, even myself, to do that, and when you do that, that's when you get that check, like literally the next day. And I've had that experience where they wrote $200,000, here it is, love the idea. And that's, that's what you want. You don't want to just drown out the noise. Okay, that's great. Let's, you know, the, 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 go ahead. One other book that has the 10 slide model. And um, so Guy Kawasaki's Art of the Start, I'm sure a number of you people have heard it, seen him speak, but he has a 10 slide model. I think it's a 30, 20, 10 model, you know, 30 points, you know, 20 minutes, 10 slides. So that's another good reference. You know, 10 slides is great if you can tell a compelling story within that time frame. But that would be the other book that uh, you might want to take a look at if you're trying to put together a pitch deck. Okay, great, thank you. Do you go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, the way I see it is, it's how much calories they're gonna spend to understand your story. And, the brain is huge energy consumption. You want to make it efficient when you tell that story in, of your company. So be as efficient as possible. Okay, that's great. I, I'm going to I'm going to take a turn. Randy, what would you like to tell this? <laughs> I just want to I want to leave you all with with this idea, and and this is uh, ownership. I noticed a long time ago. I've been practicing for 30 years. Uh, not that's that's a few decades. Okay, 
But one of the things I noticed early on, no matter what the situation was, it doesn't matter what, what I was working on, I, it boiled down to two questions. Every IP issue or conflict or, has come down to two questions, and I want you to remember this. What's the IP and who owns it? Okay? You're going to spend most of your time doing that. And if you don't do things up, up front right to make sure that you own the IP and that it includes the, the, all, everything, all the things we've been talking about, make sure that you actually do either own what you're, what you're using or you've got a license to it or you've got permission to use it. And this applies to every type of IP that you've got. Obviously, if you're going to bring on, if you're a fiduciary, you have a fiduciary responsibility to assign. But it's still a good idea to have employment contracts and other contracts among your, all your principals and everybody. If they come up with something on company time having to do with this venture, it's got to be, everybody's got to understand that. Now, they do understand that, but it's always good to put it in writing. That way we don't have to ever worry about that. I'm sure that that's happened with you. But here's another thing. It's very easy, especially if you start getting people who are starting to make a social media splash. They're out there trying to, you know, put stuff on, on what is it, Instagram? What are the kids using these days? Uh, TikTok? Okay. I don't know. I still have a MySpace account. I don't, I don't get a lot of hits, but, but I can't say I ever did. But, okay. But there, you could have somebody innocuously be out there trying to push your, you know, hey, let's make a new post or something. And they go and they do a Google search or whatever search and they find some image and they put it in the background and we're off and running. And guess what? You hear from Agency Swiss or whoever these, you know, people out here and say, guess what? You used our copyrighted material. We've got, uh, you know, robots that are out there looking, hoping that you have, you know, stolen it. And guess what? You get to write us a check for five grand, ten grand, something like that, just to make it go away. Never, ever, ever use anything, including images or any, unless you know that you own it or you've got absolute right to it. That will save you lots of your seed capital because that's, that's, that's happened to us, didn't it? Yeah, okay. So that's, that's a small thing, right? But this is being aware of what's your IP strategy, being aware of what is the IP. Everything is owned. It has value. Let's protect it, okay? Let's, 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 let's keep it secret. Let's keep it safe. Let's protect it in a way that makes sense. And make sure that we know who owns it. And, and, you know, the other thing that I'm going to tell you is that you think you got to think in terms of defensive strategy. You want to make sure that we don't infringe somebody else's rights. It's not possible to do that 100%, but there are a lot of tools out there. To the extent that you can, you want to make sure that you can practice it. And then to the extent that it makes sense, which is a marketing decision, you want to go out and take affirmative steps, like patenting and things like that. These are the kinds of things that you tell the clients when you see them. Okay. Very good. Okay, so what would you like to talk about next? What would you like these guys to know? And, and ladies, I mean, people, these, yeah. these, these persons. I, th I think for me, it, as an as a entrepreneur or founder, a lot of these strategies for IP really comes down to market needs. So one of the things I really love doing is bottom-up research. So there is this professor, Danny Warsa at Brown University of School of Entrepreneurship. Uh, he has a great story about that, which is the Tide detergent. So if you heard the story, uh, here it goes. Uh, back in the day, in the 90s, uh, there was Tide detergent was this big box, massive box, and it was a powder form. And what they wanted to know, the product team at uh, PNG, was how people were using their product. So they started going to people's houses. Lo and behold, they got to the house and gave this big box of Tide to a lady. She grabs this box and sets it on the table and then proceeds to stab it with a big old knife. And the product team was perplexed. They're like, why, what are you doing? Why are you opening the box with a big knife? It's like, this is how I've used your product for 30 years. Well, that's interesting. So they went out and other houses, and lo and behold, they found out that people were doing that. They were using a knife to open the box. And that's what inspired Liquid Tide, which was a product that, one, was easier to carry, and two, you don't need sharp objects to open. And that's the beauty of bottom-up research. And so with any strategy you're going to do when it comes to IP, going to market, make sure that you're solving a market need. That's the most important thing. Empathize with those users. That's excellent. Okay, thank you. Lou, what else would you like to tell the crowd? 
Uh, just a couple things. The situation that Randy talked about uh, was an ag tech company, I think the second ag tech company that I did, and was brought in by the venture investors. And the founder of that company had thought she had innocently used an image that was in, she thought was in the public domain. Turns out somebody actually owned that image, and I think we ended up writing a check for $5,000. So to Randy's point, you know, the devil really is in the detail here, and you really have to have somebody who's really paying attention to these issues. Otherwise, as he said, you're gonna end up using some of your capital to, uh, to take care of some of these problems. Um, the first ag tech company I was brought into, they had the naming issue, and they picked a name that was very close to another company, and they ended up having to also write a check, and then also for a period of time had to have on their website, we are not this other company whose name was very similar. So, um, so attention to sort of the detail at the front end here um, can have a, a real impact in terms of your company and where you're going to have to spend some money. So, you know, to me, again, you know, echoing I think some of the comments here, first and foremost, it's do you really understand the problem that you're trying to solve and can you do it in such a way that you can actually make the kinds of returns on any investor capital, right? Because as soon as you start bringing in institutional capital, whether it be PE, strategic, uh, venture, you know, you now have a very different world that you have to deal with as the CEO of a startup, right? So when I'm working with um, CEOs, because one of the things I do now is I do work, work with some early stage CEOs, and I always sort of advise them, once you take institutional capital, your world has fundamentally changed. And I always tell people, assume you're going to spend 25 to 30 percent of your time dealing with investor-related issues. Now, that may sound high. Um, you have to be very thoughtful as a CEO in terms of who you take as your capital partner. You need to do as much due diligence on them as they're going to do on you. Right? So you really want to make sure you are aligned in terms of how you're thinking about the business, how you're thinking about the opportunity, um, and really you know, the kinds of fiduciary obligations they have to their limited partners, you know, those are things you as a CEO need to be aware of and conscious of as you build your company. So those would be some other Great. things. Thank you. Zach, what, do you, what would you like to tell the crowd? Uh, it's, you know, a lot, we've been saying it over and over, so I, I hope you got it now. You identify the problem, obviously, is key. Um, another thing to consider, too, in terms of branding, uh, like Manny was discussing earlier, yeah, of course, you want to know if somebody else is using your name. Um, but something I've actually seen um, a lot, or happening a lot lately, and it's kind of a PSA for everybody, is if you get an email from, a random email from some company that says that, you know, you, you, let's just say you filed an LLC, you just opened an LLC, you get this email and they say, we are going to file a trademark on your name unless you work with us to yeah. get your trademark. It's very Likely a scam. You know, yeah. I've gotten probably six calls, people freaking out, co clients of ours freaking out. You know, oh, are they going to take my trademark? I only have a state trademark. What's the difference between a state and a federal registration? And so I, I calm them down, like, this is likely a scam. Let's identify it. Let's check it out, see if it has any legs. Uh, most of the time, it's been a scam. But then it opens the door to the conversation. Well. Are you nervous that somebody's going to take your trademark? Are you nervous that somebody's going to take your goodwill from you, tarnish your business names with inferior services? I mean, if that's a real concern, why haven't you trademarked? Uh, it provides a level of um, legitimacy to your business. Uh, and I think it, in terms like this, it helps alleviate um, or at least forestall any of these kinds of issues. Um, again, due diligence is important. I, I emphasize that, or I can't emphasize that enough. You know, you don't want to get into a trademark battle. I don't like having to deal with demand letters from a client perspective. Um, I don't mind issuing them out either. Uh, so <laughs> don't take my client's trademarks. Um, but that's, uh, that's kind of the point that I think um, we try to provide here, just some value. And I think that ultimately, if you are going to pursue IP, you should talk to somebody. It's important. Uh, it could be some of the most important assets that your business owns. 
So just take the time, do it right, get it right the first time, and have that conversation early. You don't want to be doing cleanup at the end or find out two years later that somebody else uh, has taken your name. That's good. One more point on the, on the, uh, the branding side of this. Remember that your brand is describing your product. Don't, don't choose your brand too soon. Don't find something that's great and then go try to figure out what your product is. You've done it backwards. You're not going to like what I'm about to tell you, but your brand is secondary to your product. Make a good product, make a good service, and you can slap anything on there. And over time, that is going to be a great product, a great brand. Okay. The other problem is, is that people want to short circuit it. And so they want to come up with something that's descriptive. You know, you know, modern tech is good. Modern dot tech is good because it, it's suggestive. Obviously it's, it's modern, hopefully, and it's, you know, technical, but you don't really know what it is. But you could go a little bit further, like, you know, like, like, like I'm, I'm terrible at this, but, you know, speedy televisions or, or speedy, speedy networks or something. You know, that's terrible. That's a, that's a horrible name. And I'm sorry if that's your name. I apologize. But just, you know, don't do it too early. Don't do it too late. Find it because what a, what a, what a mark does, what a trademark does is it protects your goodwill. And you're not going to have goodwill until you start selling products, start selling services. Okay, that's whenever you're going to start having trademark rights. So... Think, think broadly, do the searching and so on, have several available to you, and then when, when the time's right, you're gonna feel it, and you'll know, and go with it, all right? It's, it is kind of organic, but don't fall in love with your brands. That's, that's silly, that's, that's sad, um, and it'll cause you, cause you problems. We've got time for some questions. Would, would anybody like to ask some questions? That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Make, oh, go ahead. Do you, you wanna ask a question? Yeah, I wanna oh, ask okay. a question to you guys. Um, you, know, you mentioned AI at the beginning, uh, but can you talk a little bit more specifically about sort of AI and the impact you're seeing on both IP, trademarks, copyrights, because um, I've certainly, you know, it's one of the things that I'm very sensitive to these days. Yeah. And so if you guys could talk about what you're seeing, you know, from the client perspective right. and how people are looking at AI on these kinds of issues that we're talking about, that'd be helpful. Well, truly half the patent applications I'm writing these days have some sort of AI component because let's face it, everything you know, your coffee maker has it or is going to. Um, but, and it's still highly patentable, right? As long as you get it into a product, as long as, you know, it's, it, you can, it's, it, there's no uh, restriction against software patents. You just have to go about it the right way so that you're not patenting the algorithm. But what we need to think about is, is remember what I said before, what's the IP and who owns it? One of the problems that you have is, is that if it's AI generated content, it is not protectable. There is no copyright on that. The way the copyright laws work right now, for example, is if you, if you create a work, that's fine. Go ahead and do it. The, the goal is to advance it, but recognize that if you use AI, then you're not going to be able to protect it uh, very strongly, if at all. And there's not going to be any copyright attachable to it. The, the extent that you do have copyright will be to the extent that you as a human uh, curated it, either pre or post curation or other aspects of it. The, the Copyright Office will allow you at this point to get some protection but the trend we're going in right now is that it's not going to be protectable at all. And so think about that. What if you use AI to write code? Okay. Well, that's fine. I, I assume it works, right? It's not going to be original. It's going to be based on what's already been trained. So don't expect innovative code. But if you need that, but a question you got to ask is, what if you claim somebody against somebody copyright infringement? And they come back and show, well, yeah, but half your code is... Is, uh, is, is AI generated. I mean, that's gonna impact the value of your, of your IP. So be smart about, about that. We're just on the beginning cusp of this. You know, rights of publicity, what, California just passed a couple of uh, laws that look pretty good about trying to protect people. This is gonna ripple through our entire society, right? And nobody knows yet what's gonna, what all is gonna happen. To me, it's very exciting. It's going to promote human uh, creativity and so on. It's gonna make our lives better. But there, it is fraught with difficulties. And try not to be the test case on, on how this works out, OK? That's my, my advice. Do you, want to, you got anything to add, or are you OK? Uh, just, you want to ask these people? Yeah, just OK. Megan? Oh. oh, OK, thank you. What do you want first? Go, go, you, you, you get to pick. You're, you're our monitor. You, you pick who two talks. Hi, hey, thanks, guys. A couple questions, one on trademark and patent as well. Um, I'm one of the companies where we have found hundreds of influencers using some of our images, our product images, because they look the best in the industry. 
some have just straight out used them. Others have um, cleared off the label and, and used theirs, but it's obvious it's ours. So I was given uh, counsel by an attorney that said I didn't have standing to go after them until I actually had it registered with the UPTSO on the federal level. So I'm curious if there is any sort of poor man's uh, copyright on, on that uh, front, but, but also um, uh, because there's, like, is, would an or ornamental uh, patent be best to sort of give the overall look? Okay, there's that. And then um, uh, on the, on the uh, uh, patent side, if we have an internal logistic piece of software that helps us internally, right? And uh, there was a competitor who may have developed their own. It's tough to exactly know if what they're using behind the scenes, whereas like a, a trademark infringement, it's obvious, it's out in the public, you can see it. So what's the minimum standing that's needed to be able to go after a company? Like we hired an employee and we, if, when I interviewed them, it was like, oh, that's interesting. They're kind of using something we do. So is that enough standing or how does that work? Because okay. it's sort of under the hood. Okay, you've asked several questions, so let's break it down and, and try to go through here briefly. All of them have a, a central theme to it. Um, your best bet, this, this is practical advice, okay? Like I said, this is not a highly technical discussion. This is more strategic. The real question is, is, is that why not just let them get away with it? I mean, ask that question. Sometimes other people kind of using your marks or doing other things, that's not always bad. You know, it, so so evaluate that. Don't just don't immediately go into what you call it bulldog mode or oh, scorched the earth. Yeah, cur scorched earth mode. Don't immediately do that because these people, it it might be to your advantage to just kind of let it slide or you know send them some swag or something. I don't know. Make them get them on your side. Uh, to the extent that there is some really egregious bad stuff going on, take down notices are, are a really good idea. That's probably the most effective way. Probably the reason that your attorney told you that is is because it's easier to get YouTube or one of these other things, whatever the kids are using, to, to honor a, a, a to take down notices that if you show them a registration that, that's easier, so that's probably the, that context. But copyright is the other thing. If you can show copyright infringement, if you can, that they're going to, I mean, everybody's going to jump. You're going to get immediately take down. So try to, try to phrase it that way. Your second question had to do with ornamentation, and at that, this point I'm going to turn it over to you because I don't remember... Yeah, so essentially for design patents, you're protecting the ornamental appearance of something. So uh, it doesn't protect functionality, it just protects how something looks. So in this case, if you have a unique design, if there's some element that's not out there in the world that nobody else has seen before, um, or there's something that's not too similar, then you might be able to get a design patent. The only issue that I see immediately is that it looks like it's already out there. So uh, there is such a thing called the public disclosure. Um, if you publicly disclose your ideas, your designs, et cetera, um, it, it, you start a clock un unintentionally. You start a clock. You have 12 months from the date of that disclosure to go file a patent. And if, if you don't file that patent, then you lose those rights. It's now part of the public domain. So that is another thing to consider is when did you make this product available? Are you making sales on it yeah. too? So it has to deal with the, the product itself. Um, so in terms of a utility patent, for instance, have you conveyed it to like an audience like this that has with enough sufficient clarity yeah. uh, in, in order for them to actually reproduce it? It would have to be an enabling disclosure, right? Enable. You just kind of talk about it, that they don't really know how to, how to build it, you're probably okay. But if you've opened the kimono, excuse me, but that's you know, a phrase, then you're, you know, if you're outside the 12 months, then you're outside the 12 months. Okay. Pick somebody else for us. Hi there. Thank you for all the insight. Um, just had a question, wondering if um, if if you can patent a common product uh, if you're using a new material. Usually not. Um, it would most likely if if the new material was brand new, maybe so. Oh yeah, maybe so. I just having a conversation. Um, most likely not. If if, uh, if, the, if the material already exists and the product otherwise exists, most most examiners uh, would think that there would be a matter of, of just being obvious to substitute one material for another. So generally, I would say no. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. The, the key is, is that that's worth looking into and, and considering it and, and thinking about in terms of what advantage do you have, right? Uh, I've got, what, what is this? This is Colorado, right? So we've got um, hemp and, and marijuana everywhere. So hemp fabric is becoming very popular and used in a lot of places. And we've been able to get both trademarks and patents in that space, even though it is a known fabric. So I, I guess I can say it depends. Sorry, that's, that's the best. That's what you get from asking a lawyer a question. Yes and no. Um, uh, where's my... Yes, so uh, I'm in, uh, my startup is uh, AI and healthcare. And I just want to double check is what I'm hearing a lot about patents, uh, IP, I think I'm good, trademark, I think I'm good. But as far as patents go, I did talk to a patent attorney pretty early on. And I was like, I have these unique designs, functionality, should I actually move forward in that process? And he said, well, it's moving so quickly, you're going to put it out there, it's public, anybody can look at it. And somebody can ch somebody can build it themselves and make a few modifications, like a bigger player. Um, and I just want to see if that's still good advice. Like, what do you guys, you know, do you recommend? It's just, hey, it's execution. Just keep moving. Don't worry about it yeah. because it's AI. Or what do you think? I'll say the same thing about patents that I said about trademarks. Remember, don't fall in love with your trademarks. Fall in love with your product. Right. And you're right. If you if it's if it's fast moving then maybe it's not worth patenting. I've had clients tell me that. On the other hand, you don't know what's gonna still be around 20 years from now. I mean, none of us do. So you're just making an investment. Mm -hmm. I can't say that you got good or bad advice, but okay. you got advice, so right. I, I patent stuff like that all the time. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So your key takeaway number two, always ask what, it, always ask what is the IP and who owns it? Uh -huh. So in my team, um, one of the developers, when he was in graduate school, he paid for a license that says for educational use only, okay. and now we're, we're gonna commercialize a product. So he reached out to the, to the owner of the IP and said, hey, I paid you for an educational license, um, I'd like to get a license to commercialize it. And the guy DM'd him back, uh, Discord says, oh, it's fine, go ahead and use it, it's all good, no worries, you don't have to pay me anything. So my question is now, do I have to ask a lawyer and get this papered, or is it good enough that we have the, the, pat, the IP owners? If you have it in writing. Yeah, we have it in writing. If you have it in writing, even if it's an email, I would. I yeah, it's, a dis, it's on Discord, yeah. Okay. You haven't put $5 in my pocket, okay, so yeah. I've just given you some. I know, it's, <laughs> worth, what you're, it's worth what I'm paying but for. But generally, yeah. you, you, you've got to make sure that you have, um, you know, if he's giving you a license, if he said it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, he said it's okay, and I'm buying you a beer. Well, I, you know, um, well, I'd, I'd really, I'd feel more, how comfortable do you, do you that's, feel? That's, that's, I'm feel as a, as a CFO to, and as the I investor, you, I'm feeling a little squeamish. Just, I, there's a whole, all sorts of questions you want to ask. Is there a way to easily get around it? Because you can, it's better to solve a problem, you know, if you can. If you can get rid of a problem, then that's what you want to do rather, you know, if, if you can. So if you can work around it and, and come up with a new solution that doesn't use it at all, that would be my advice. But next is, I would Yeah, we could, we could build our own. Good. Well, then that's, I, it'd be worth doing it to not have to worry about it. Okay, thank How you. How much time do we have left? Three minutes. How many? Three. Three minutes? Okay. Um, let's, would you ask this lady? Hi, my name is Olympia. I have a... Um, an AI um, MVP, and it's for uh, uh, helping people pass in like licensure exams. And so the point is right now, the AI is like growing and speeding up, and there's always something coming new every week. <laughs> and everybody jumps on it, and there's trends and this and that. Um, so how would I be able to protect this? Because it's not just, I mean, I see the AI as a tool, like, okay, I have screwdrivers and all of it's that. It's a tool. AI is a tool. So I can build a car or I can build an airplane or whatever, right? right? So the point is how do I, let's say my thing is an airplane, so how do I protect the, uh, the airplane, yeah. <laughs> my, my product, uh, which runs with um, AI, and by AI I mean not just generally a large language model, but it also uses, um, there is uh, like open source um, companies, let's say, that provide open source. Right. But uh, the idea is that I use this plus that plus that to create the product. Okay. So how can I protect this? Well, remember what, what it says up here somewhere. It says, what's the IP and who owns it? And if it's open source, great. 
make sure you're following those open source licenses because there are restrictions on that. Another issue that we didn't talk about, and I know we're just out of, out of time, but this is going to be litigated, ultimately solved by Congress. Can training data be used? I mean, there's, there's lawsuits going on right now. You know, how you train your model. You know, people might come back to you and object to your system because, hey, you didn't have the rights to use this training data, right? And maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I don't know. There's all sorts of issues, but to, to answer her question, her question is, is she has an AI, she has a healthcare, right, healthcare related. Not necessarily healthcare, okay. but it's, it's a, it's a it, it, Okay, it's an expert type system that has an AI component. All I can say is, is that focus on what it is that you created, and that's what you want to protect to the extent that you can. And if patent makes sense, go for it. And, and if not, at least copyright and, and trade secret and other issues. Focus on what you've come up with. Oh. Let's do one Thank more. Over here. I, got, I got one quick one. Oh, uh, just person didn't get the names of the books earlier uh, on the pitch deck. So the first book is called Get Backed, and the two authors are Evan Baer, B-A-E-H-R, and Evan Loomis. So if you just put Get Backed into Amazon, you'll find it. So, And then the book, uh, the two books about uh, from Carmen, it's Carmen Simon, um, C-A-R-M-E-N, I believe, S-I-M-O-N, um, and I forget the two names, but if you, again, put her name into Amazon, you'll find both books. Are we out of time? It says wrap up. Really quick, um, what about using iterative processes in the beginning phases of designing a trademark, a logo, brand mark, um, using AI in the very beginning stages, iterative processes, now what if your end result, finalized logo, somewhat resembles that one of the iterative processes, will you still have some, how does that affect you copyright? Find that one, I'll leave you with this, and I'm going to stand up because we're done. Um, the question, the good news is, is that uh, as far as AI is concerned, you're probably fine in the area of trademarks. Because trademarks, as long as you're not violating somebody's copyright, which you wouldn't be in this case, it's, it's the actual symbol or the, or the, the, the logo or, or whatever it is that you're using, word, that identifies your source of goods and the goods you put into commerce. So nobody cares if it's been created by AI or not. So you're probably fine. Um, just to clarify, on the other end, protecting our own IP after that. Yeah, yeah uh, you're, you're limited to the extent that it's AI generated, like, like we were saying. So okay. I, I'm sorry I can't Thanks, do any more than that. You. you all have been a wonderful group. Thank you all so much for coming. Can we give us a, a round of applause to the people?